you everybody welcome to off panel a weekly interview podcast about all things comics brought to you by sketch.com i'm your host david harper and this week's guest is the writer and artist of comics like packless and 1949 at image comics it's dustin weaver thanks for coming on dustin hey thanks for having me so we are recording this early on a friday so you and i are barely awake how yeah. is the day starting for you dustin Ah, uh, you know, this is early for me. I, I typically am up at night, so. Oh, no. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm very flexible, so I, I adjusted. I I wore myself out and went to bed early, so I, I've had a full night of sleep. But yeah, typically I'm taking a nap around now. Okay. It is kind of funny. I think I had this conversation in San Diego Comic-Con recently, and I was talking to some people, and it does seem like there's a disproportionate amount of night owls that are comic artists. Is it just because like that's the time you have available to you to do your work and not have kind of people around? Or is it just kind of how you are? What leads to that for you? Oh, yeah, that's that's exactly it. You know, during the day, I'm working at home, you know, I have a wife and a daughter. And so I spend time with when I'm not having a nap, when I'm not sleeping. And uh, yeah, it's just at night, there's uh, fewer distractions. It's easier to focus when everybody's asleep, except for the internet is a, is a still a problem. But <laughs> that's always a, always a problem. At least most of the people you might talk to on there would be asleep probably by then. Yeah, you can see, uh, you know, it's like, okay, England's awake, you know. Oh, yeah. Something. It's <laughs> They're conspiring against your productivity. It's terrible. Exactly. Is nighttime, like your drawing time? Like, do you write during the day? Do you have kind of a firm separation of those things? I'm kind of curious because it does seem like most of the writer artists I know are like, I kind of have to write during the day. And then nighttime is the time where I can really like ink and really get into a project. On the art side. You know, I don't have like a very, I'm not very disciplined with like, this is when I write and this is when I draw sort of thing. It's it's very much trying to go with whatever I'm feeling like at, at any time or just what has to be done next is what I will do next, uh, regardless of, of what time it is, what time of day it is. It's all over the place as far as that goes. I mean, that kind of makes sense for Packless. Packless is a one-man anthology where, you know, in most situations, it'd be like uh, when I talk to other creators, it might be them switching between interiors and covers if you're an artist, or maybe writing and drawing if you do both. Or for writers, you might like work on a different script each day. But for you, you can hop from like Hero over to like Amia Cycle. Yeah. Yeah, you could hop between those, or you could do like a mini story. You could do all kinds of different things. So here's a perfect example. In the back of issue eight, you talk about how in issue nine, you're going to be doing Juniper Lodge that one is very whim based you're like i have this stuck in my head i have to tell the story hero will come back in the next issue and it's really interesting how that works because this is your baby because because this is a one-man anthology i imagine that really allows your schedule to be like a choose your own adventure story in the maximum sense of that phrase yeah yeah i mean this, th that's a good example of where i am taking advantage of the freedom of this format and why not you know in, in a different format you can't really do this you know, just kind of go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this story, and I'll come back to the other story. Uh, there's, you know, th that freedom comes with a downside in that there's changing gears slows you down in, in any anything like switching from okay, I'm telling I'm, I'm in this story, I got to get back to this story. And, and, you know, I might be using a different kind of style, different tools, I have to kind of reacquaint myself with that thing. And then to set that aside and go like, okay, now I'm going to you know, draw a cover for, uh, you know, sectars, which was something I'm doing, did recently, where it's like, okay, completely different mindset. Now I got to completely change gears out of doing Juniper Lodge to doing, you know, a toy from the 80s cover or something. Um, and just that just that changing gears, it really slows things down, especially when, you know, something like doing the, the covers for Sectars or Roboforce. Uh, these are some recent things that are on my mind. So they're the examples that I'm using, but they're things that I'm not fully familiar with. So I'm watching the cartoons, I'm reading the comics that were put out. I'm, I'm educating myself so I can have a take and, a, and an idea of what where to go with what I'm going to draw. And it's just for, you know, one image. I, I do, I'll put in all the homework. Otherwise, I don't I don't know what I'm doing, you know? So yeah, really? The, yeah, the point is, is this changing gears thing. It's a, it, it can be a drag, but also very fun to have the freedom to just go with a feeling, you know, to do Juniper Lodge, you know? 
Well, I mean, the key is being flexible, I imagine. It seems like you have a lot of flexibility in yourself mentally because you wouldn't be able to do that Juniper Lodge switch without that. And I don't know. That's impressive. A, a lot of times, I think people have a tendency of being like kind of monomaniacal about things. It's like, this mm-hmm. is what I'm working on. This is what I'm working on. And you're just like, ah, today feels like uh, telling a story about that weird hotel sign I saw one time. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly it. It just stuck in my head. There was a horror story. It was very... This is a vague image of a story, you know, like this very out of focus story. And I'm like, what is that thing? I have to get closer to that. I have to flesh it out. I have to know what that is. And, uh, you know, just, just, you know, pulling it out, you know, drawing it out and kind of going like, oh, this is, this is what I want to do. And part of that is that that story and the, the, there's another story that will be in uh, Packlist 9, uh, which is called Defects in a Hand-Drawn Line. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, both of these are set in contemporary real worlds, which is not something that I get that I'm drawing a lot of. Like otherwise, it's all science fiction, and and it feels really good because I'm a big movie lover. So it's sort of so many movies are that so many movies that I love are you know normal people, and so it's kind of like oh I'm I'm doing some I'm doing this I'm exploring this other thing that I really like. That's one of the beauties of Packless. I do want to get into your background here a little bit, and this is like a perfect spot to do it. One of the things I really love about Packless is, again, the choose-your-own-adventure nature of it. Issue number zero, which you recently did, was you publishing, I believe, for the first time, a bunch of old comics that you did. Like, one of them was from 1997, and it was called Seventeen. And it was a comic about you and a friend sitting in Phillips International in in Anchorage, Alaska. As you probably know, I'm in Anchorage, Alaska. And I was really struggling. I was like, I think I remember that. And then I Googled it and I was like, there are actually still restaurants in those locations. They've just changed over like 15 times since then. But I mean, that's the interesting thing is 17 is like a very autobiographical comic where you were kind of embracing a certain side of you, like kind of, it was almost like a little bit more poetic than usual. And it had a lot more of a yourself in there where you were like, there's this shot where you can see fifth Avenue in Anchorage, which has changed dramatically since then. I do want to emphasize. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, that's only one of two directly autobiographical comics you've published. Why is yourself a subject you want to tackle occasionally with these types of comics? I guess I like a lot of different kinds of comics and stories in general. Yeah, yeah. When I was doing that, you know, I did that back in 1997. Right. <laughs> yeah, Packless Zero is kind of a is is a real weird thing. I am basically doing what a lot of artists don't do, and it's just pulling out all my old stuff and going, "Hey, look!" Where so many artists are kind of like, "Never look at this; it's horrible." But I'm like, "Hey, pretty good, right?" I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I thought you did a really good job. Even your your quote unquote knockoff X Men. I was like, I feel like there's a little bit of knockoff Wildcats in here too, which I think is knockoff X Men to begin with. Yes, yeah, yeah. I have literally like a Wildcats submission pages in there that that I uh, just re repurposed, renamed everybody, and changed their colors of their costumes and stuff. Warblade did seem familiar. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I called him Golden Boy, and I uh, nice. And I, I don't know. It was just sort of silly. And I made his metal all gold. Not long before that, I had read some Love and Rockets. And the idea, which isn't an autobiographical comic, but it was clear like that what Jaime Hernandez was doing was kind of like drawing on the people that he knew or life that, as he knew it and just putting it into a comic. And, and it kind of seemed, it's sort of deceptive in that you're like, I could do that. I'm going to do that. And I started doing that sort of stuff uh, i would just i have like the most embarrassing comics that i drew just in my notebook during school i was not a very good student the, you know it'd be like uh, almost just acting out things with people in life and they those are terrible that 17 story it was originally going to be longer it was kind of me kind of taking the idea more seriously and of doing a real world thing based on myself and things that I knew, you know, uh, kind of writing what you know, sort of thing. So I was I was taking it very seriously, but I had to I had to change gears. So I only had so many pages. And when I came time to doing Packless Zero, I was kind of looking at those pages and going, okay, well, how can I put this back together? And I kind of made it more autobiographical than it was originally. Mm. Um, because I was looking at it and kind of going like, gosh, I was really working, you know, I had just moved away from Alaska when I was drawing it. Mm. Before I left, I went and took a bunch of photo reference around Anchorage. 
then I was drawing it after I had left. And I was actually 18 when I was drawing it. But yeah, I was kind of working through life, you know, yeah. at the time. So I could kind of look back at it and kind of recognize it all the more for what it was. But yeah, I uh, <laughs> I wondered uh, how, how, you, how much you'd appreciate those uh, depictions of Anchorage. Uh, they're pretty accurate to 97. They were very accurate. They were very accurate. I will say I was more of a Denny's guy than a Village Inn or Phillips International Inn. So. Right, yeah. That was mostly because it was close to my high school. I went to service. And so my friend and I would skip. For, actually, we just didn't have first hour. We would go to there before first hour, and then we would drive up to school. We were the people who were on a first-name basis with the waiter at Denny's, Remo. The guy yeah. was eternal. He's amazing. But <laughs> so going back, I've talked to you about some things that I know are kind of architectural for you. You know, you were a big Marvel Universe trading card fan. Uh, I talked to you for a piece that I did back in the day on Multiversity Comics. What got you into actually reading comics originally? You know, before I was ever reading comics, you know, I was a drawing kid. You know, I moved around a lot when I was in grade school. And in every school and every like classroom, uh, every grade level, there's always a drawing kid who was already there in place. It was like a kid who had discovered that they could, <laughs> you know, win people over by drawing pictures. Uh, so I would show up and I'd be the new drawing kid. This isn't like a Highlander type situation, is it? It is kind of. It's a bit of a Highlander <laughs> thing. There, we it was. <laughs> we would get into some kind of very. Uh, you know, it'd be like, oh, we're friends now, but also we're weirdly competitive with one another. Who will win out? Who will be the drawing the, kid? The drawing kid, yes. And I, I destroyed them all. I destroyed them all. <laughs> so, I mean, I was such a drawing kid that before I ever read comics, I had read and studied uh, drawing comics the Marvel way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I was familiar with, I was like kind of drawing these things a little bit already. But uh, we moved, it's when, really when we moved to Alaska, my family, it was sixth grade and several of the kids in that class, this was 1990, 91, they were into comics and they had the Marvel trading cards were coming out at this time. And I was just looking for things that were cool to draw. Like some of these kids were into like Warhammer and they had like these books and I was like, oh, like the artwork in this stuff, uh, like there's really cool artwork here. And at that age, you know, I was just copying stuff, you know, oh, yeah. you're, you're kind of absorbing information by copying what, uh, what artists are doing and figuring out how, how to do this. I was also doing life drawing and stuff. It wasn't just comic art or whatever the artwork, art, artwork is in these magazines, but it was kind of a struggle to get into comics for me. The first time I went, it was after the Batman 89, you know, I think for a lot of people my age that had just a massive impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to a comic book shop for the first time. And, you know, I was listening back to uh, a podcast you did with your wife, I think. And it, one of the, the, the topic was kind of like how, you know, intimidating, I guess, comics are or how hard they are to get into. How do you know where to start? Exactly. And I, I really identify with that. Like, I did not understand the numbering. I didn't know there were like three, at that time, at least three Batman books. I didn't get it. I, and, and I struggled to get into comics at that point. And then with these, with these kids, you know, they had the, those trading cards and the trading cards were a big help because they had you know, information on them, you know, you can get like the story of just exactly who Ghost Rider is on the card. And, uh, and you're like, okay, well, I, I think I have a way in. I think I, I think I get this to some degree. I was trying in a big way because I wanted cool stuff to draw. I was interested in the art. One of the uh, things is like on the series two cards is all those Arthur Adams cards. Oh, yeah. I really honed in on that. I was because he signed them all with a little AA. And I was like, this guy, this AA, he's, he knows what's up. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, this is really cool. Um, what kind of hooked me in and I was like, okay, I got to read this was uh, the Larry Hama, Mark Silvestri Wolverine run. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was just something about that, that I think it was still Wolverine was very much in like this kind of pulp mode. It was starting to become more uh, like there was more continuity stuff. You know, the X-Men were popping up or. Uh, cable was popping up or but it was i don't know the way that he handled it was very accessible to me and the artwork was great i think there's something about wolverine at that time too where not even he knew his own history is all kind of up in question 
I liked that. He didn't even know his own continuity. He couldn't be expected to know yeah. his continuity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I never thought about it like that. Yeah. He was very appealing for that reason. Yeah, exactly. You know, I was like, okay, I, I maybe I'm a Wolverine fan, you know, and I started buying everything with Wolverine. But in doing that, I picked up the uh, Barry Windsor Smith Weapon X issues. Oh, boy. And uh, that was kind of like, okay, like, this is a game changer to me. Comics can't be good. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, the Larry Hama Salvestri stuff is good. But there was something else, you know, maybe maybe not good, but maybe like something closer to being like art. You know what I mean? There's a kind of ambiguity built into it or something that just triggers the imagination. But, you know, what really sealed the deal is X-Men number one comes along and it was Jim Lee. I was pretty much like I became a Jim Lee super fan, like like very quickly. I was like, this guy is the very best. And then, you know, then a year after that, it was image launched. And it was kind of like the answer to all the problems that I was having where, you know, everything had like this long continuity that I that I was a little alienated by. You know, when I when I got into Jim Lee, I was picking up all the uncanny X-Men Jim Lee issues. And I was often just confused. Uh, I had a friend at that point who really knew it all. So I was always asking him, like, what is the deal? What's going on with this? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, which was helpful. But yeah, it's sort of when Image came along, I'm like, oh, I, I might want to I might want to do this, you know. I mean, that totally makes sense. I do think it's interesting. One comic that's in Packlist number six is Quitting Comics, which is a comic you did in 2018. And it's a comic about how the only way you could make comics was to quit comics. But you were saying it very maniacally in the book. It's auto That's the second autobiographical <laughs> comic you published. And yeah. It's it's also about how the formation of image set you on a path and established a mindset in some ways. Yeah. How do you think your own interests in comics have evolved over the years? Because I was looking back on an interview we had done at when I was at Multiversity, and you were talking about you know a, a bunch of you know manga you were into European comics, like how Travis Charest was a big guy for you, and obviously Charest has Wildstorm stuff, but he's done a lot of European things too. Starting with Larry Hama and Mark Silvestri, going to Barry Windsor Smith, going to Jim Lee, it seems like your world has opened up dramatically and you've been kind of a voracious uh, enjoyer of art ever since. There was a point in my teen years where I, you know, you start looking to other things uh, like, oh, what else does this have to offer? This, uh, yeah. this medium. But also I was very committed to becoming a comic book artist. So like losing interest wasn't really an option. I get the feeling like there's a lot of people that maybe go through a phase where they're like, I kind of grew out of comics for a little bit and then I came back to it, you know? Oh yeah. Mine was like three years long. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that seems about right. And, and I kind of had a similar experience where I'm like, I, I think I'm over this, but I was committed to be doing it professionally. And so I couldn't fully be over it. I had to, I was still looking, you know, and there were things, there were things that were present, you know, I, 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 during those years, there was like Sin City I liked, or uh, I remember picking up Stray Bullets. You know, uh, I was looking for things that were maybe, I don't want to say like grown up or something, but like just maybe that's the word. I also think that to some degree, it's like the thing with if you read X Men long enough or you read Wolverine long enough, you know it kind of always re returns to square exactly, one. Yeah. And then with like Stray Bullets, it's like there's no return to square one. It's just like you just keep going as long as David does it. Yeah. But uh, at that time, uh, you know, uh, I picked up Ghost in the Shell and there was something about that where I'm like, oh, wait, this is this is something that it's almost like it had been on my mind. Uh, like, oh, this is a, a science fiction thing with action. And it's like uh, it seems smart somehow, even though it's just like full of information. There's something philosophical. There's something going on here. And it was like, oh, maybe this is what I want comics to be. And very soon after that, I discovered like the uh, Akira comics. And that was like, oh, wait, this is what I want comics to be, <laughs> uh, which which is a silly idea. Like that, that isn't really what I want comics to be. But it's like it's like you have this idea in your head of like, this isn't quite doing something. Comics, you feel like maybe can do something more than what you're seeing. Do you think to some degree what it was doing was showing you that comics could be more and different in ways you hadn't imagined before? Well, yeah. The great thing with Akira is that it kind of does everything really well. There's there's humor in it. There's amazing action in it. You know, there's dialogue scenes. There's 
all this scope to it. There's small scenes, you know, of just characters in a, in a little bar. There's gigantic scenes where the entire city's blowing up. It has this full range. So I was like, ah, comics can do it all. Like comics can really do it all. <laughs> I mean, that might still be my very favorite comic of all time for those reasons. And that sort of sets you on, like, maybe there's, maybe there's other things. And, you know, but, but there were a few years where I'm kind of, I haven't found more of what I'm looking for. I think, you know, uh, when, when I finally picked up some Mobius, that was a big deal to me. And there was like this kind of realization that there's a lot of, there's all kinds of, that there's a lot of great comics. I just had to, uh, I just had to like engage a bit more than I was. They're not just going to like be on the new comic stand, you know, and I, and I'd have to like dig a little deeper. I'm not very good with that. You know, I was lucky to have a, you know, a good friend who's very good at just digging through back issue boxes and having the focus to, uh, I don't know, and remember what they're even looking for. I so often I go, you know, if I'm looking through back issues, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking for. I forget like, I don't, and I can't focus on this. I, I struggle. So I've depended on people for recommending cool things. Uh, I'll say that. And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. The most notorious name in terror is back with a vengeance. Find out why the return of the infamous and influential EC Comics is the once-in-a-lifetime comics event that reviewers are calling triumphant, horrifying, exciting, twisted, and more. From the publisher that first drove Tales from the Crypt, Weird Science, and Mad Magazine into the heart of an unsuspecting world, EC is back with two all-new unrelenting series from Oni. First, every tombstone tells a tale in Epitaphs from the Abyss, the no-holds-barred horror series channeling stories of torment and tension from Brian Azzarello, Jason Aaron, Charlie Adler, and more. Then, our cosmos hurdles toward annihilation and cruel universe, a cosmic maelstrom of the galaxy's strangest science fiction, packed with bizarre tales of time and space from creators including Corinna Bechko, Colin Bunn, Jonathan Case, and more. What the Comics Code Authority couldn't kill has only made it stranger. EC Comics lives again at Oni Press and Epitaphs from the Abyss and Cruel Universe, available now at comic shops everywhere. And now, back to the show. Well, I mean, a good example of this is like, I'm the same way. Bosco's Comics, still around in Anchorage, Alaska, by the way. And yeah. I am, they have a August back issue sale every year. And I go, and every time I go within like 30 minutes, my brain is just basically shut off. And there's some people who will be there for like six hours. And I'm like, I don't know how you do it. It's like so mentally exhausting for me. And and it, it, to some degree, it's like, I'm looking for specific things, but also I'm like, I'm just kind of generally looking. And you know, you talked about my wife when, when I did that episode earlier with her previously on off panel. Yeah. And she said, where do you start? That is a big question. But also it's like, how do you keep going? Because there is such a massive sea of comics to like possibly dig into. It's like, how do you how do you know where to go next is an equally important question. Yeah. Uh, you know, mentioning Bosco's, that was another thing that uh, really helped me get into comics was the, you know, I was living in Eagle River doing some alaska talk they just opened the boscos there didn't they they opened it right right around that time in like 91 or something like that so it was a brand new store it was very different it was very bright it was a kind of modern you know comic shop in a way so i love that place i I would go there you know i could ride my bike uh there and you know i spent a lot of time there so I'm sad that it's not there anymore. Yeah. But yeah, they, what the, the Anchorage, they changed locations, right? They moved up the street or something like that. The, I'm happy to report that it's much brighter than it used to be. It used to have that kind of classic dungeon look. And now it's it's very bright. It was in like, I believe like a former gas station. And it's very big and spacious and has all these sections and has all these events and stuff. And it's got a great feel to it. But I do want to bring up one thing involving all these different things that you're into. Because mm-hmm. we talked about how you know, you were trying to put yourself into 17. That was one thing you were trying to do. And like that, we can see that in Packless and how you could see Jaime Hernandez doing that without being like autobiographical. I do think that you, in a, in a very interesting way, you've done that throughout your career. Even something like you were doing those covers for Powers of Ten, and then you eventually put them up yourself as X-Men trading cards, because like you can't right. turn that part of your brain off. Not to keep bringing up the trading cards, but yeah. like, but then in like Edge of Spider-Verse, you actually incorporated the Marvel Universe 
universe trading cards design into it because that you thought was a good way to like introduce people to these new characters. And I think it's interesting. It's like, even when you're not being autobiographical, I think you're kind of being autobiographical, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Especially if I'm writing, I'm definitely working, working out something or building on some kind of real world idea. I, I like genre as a metaphor, you know, that kind of thing where, you, you know, it's, it's zombies, but you're really talking about, you know, society. Or something. Right, right. So this kind of like you're working out thoughts that you have on things. But uh, definitely, I mean, that Spider-Verse issue, I maybe had too many things. It was like one of the first times I'm getting to like write something. So I, I maybe had like too many ideas. I'm like, oh, I'm going to put the trading cards in there. That'll be a cool way to like give backstory. And, and it's sort of like, um, maybe that's a, maybe that's a lot uh, of stuff to put in a comic. Those powers of 10 covers. I mean, the inspiration there is, you know, they wanted just one, like, this is a focus on one character. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do this. Like, you know, Jim Lee's X-Men cards, uh, you know, at, at, at the scale of a cover, which is, which allows you to do more, but there are certain cards that he did where, you know, it's like Gambit's fighting the brood or whatever. Right. And there's like a story or something to it. Like I kind of get like, Oh, he's fighting the brood in this. This isn't just Gambit posing. And I really love that. So that was very much on my mind, specifically those cards, which I think are just the very best. It's funny. As soon as you said that Gambit card, I can perfectly visualize exactly what that card is. It's funny. I can't recall very specific things that are probably far more important, but that Gambit card, <laughs> I can absolutely remember. I, I want to dig in just uh, a few more questions on your background. So you were a Jim Lee guy. I mean, you told this story recently about how when you had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when you were a kid, you, you were able to tool, uh, tour. I never Is it Homage Studios or Homage Studios? I never knew how to properly pronounce that. I mean, I guess... It would be homage. I don't know. Whatever. One of the two. But anyways, so you did that. And then you're probably one of the few people who toured that place and then eventually interned there as well. You interned there in 2003. How do you feel like that experience impacted you? It wasn't a very long internship. I will say that, you know, during the 90s, they had a lot of interns. You know, they bring in artists, you know, back when comics were booming. You know, a lot of the a lot of the artists that were working there when I interned you know, there was like a uh, Libra Mejo, Ali Garza, and uh, Carlos Deanda. Like these guys came in, they were just like a year older than me, but they broke in, they got their internship about a year before I was ever like, I was still like, they were like a year ahead of me. Yeah. And they came in right at the right moment because after that, Jim sold Wildstorm to DC. Things were different and they weren't really doing so many internships. And I think that uh, Jim actually had to kind of like, you know, make a case for it or like fight for it a little bit to have the internship. So it wasn't a very long one, but it was, uh, of course, it had a huge impact. It was, it was kind of, it was kind of hard in a way that because I really, you know, I was, I was 23, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I was 23. Like, and, uh, and I was pretty cocky. I really, I think that I really thought that I was pretty great. And to go to to the studio every day and uh anytime I'm showing anything to Jim Lee, I think for him he was really thinking in terms of like, well, I'm telling you how to be better, right? This is my job as a as a mentor. But it was really hard to basically, okay, here's my my hero. Uh and I show him stuff that every single day, it's, it's nothing but negative responses to all of it. You know, that's not me criticizing his method there. Uh, it was just what that experience did to my, you know, ego in a way. It was like the first first time in my life I was like, maybe I'm not very good at this, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which, you know, shook me. I'm like, I've, I've been focusing on being good at this. I've, uh, this is all I've been thinking about for a decade. But yeah, it was, uh, but it was really great. You know, and the thing is, is like all of those comments were right. You know, that was the hard part about it. It's like, oh yeah, that would make that drawing better. Uh, the, yeah, if I did this instead of that. And so that stuff sticks with me. And, you know, I still think about that, you know, all of those comments, you know, 
just to see, just to have Jim Lee kind of like take your drawing, make a Xerox copy of it and take a red marker and then kind of like draw over it. Yeah. And you're kind of like, oh, right. I can see how he's thinking and where it was like every drawing became more dynamic. Right? Yeah. I mean, he can really compose a dynamic shot. So I learned a lot. I remember the first time I was edited by a very proper editor. I remember like looking through the edits and I was like, does this person hate me? <laughs> like, <laughs> are you yeah. like, are you starting beef? What's happening? And I looked at it. I was like, yeah. this is actually better. I'm really glad that this person pointed it out. It is interesting to think about that. And then also like your visit back, you know, when you went to homage studios in a very real way, you might not be a comic artist without Jim Lee, which is, I don't know if there's that many, I don't know that for sure. That's just me, like, in sure, my, yeah. my head cannon for Dustin Weaver. But yeah. it does seem like, in a real way, like, you can point to a lot of things, just, uh, like, like your path kind of started in a real way on with Jim Lee and kind of was even burnished even further when you visited the studio and that's pretty amazing but i did want to ask this is kind of funny a question to ask in the context of quitting comics but you were the artist of shield and avengers with jonathan hickman you did the infinity gauntlet secret wars series together with jerry duggan which i talked to you for um for a mini oral history on sketched you worked on edge of spider-verse you've done other things at marvel as well including covers for the most recent run of x-force but the interesting thing about reading quitting comics is like looking at that kind of i'm sure some of that was dramatized to some degree (laughs) yeah Yeah. but i mean it's like to some degree working on four higher comics is just not what you really always wanted envisioned for yourself i'm curious as to what were your big learnings from your time at marvel were there things that really helped you figure out what you wanted for yourself as a comic book storyteller and an artist and everything well i think that i had this kind of vision in my head of a path that i was going to be taking you know, which would have related to what the image guys did. You know, I really thought like I, I wanted to draw the work for hire stuff. I, I wanted to do that to a certain point. You know, I thought like, oh, sure, you put your time in and you draw, <laughs> you know, you draw for Marvel or whatever. And then the next step is, is you become the greatest comic book artist in the industry. And then you you go do your own thing. Right. I think it's uh, an exact easy. path. Yeah. yeah. Super easy. Yeah. So and, and I thought that I was going to do all that you know, when I was, uh, when I was 15, you know, I was like, I'll be the youngest guy to do that. That's what I think I can do. So it took, it took longer to get to the point where I wanted to do my own thing. And the the industry was a completely different place. And, uh, and I was a different sort of artist than those guys, really. I didn't know how much I was until I did Packlist because all the image founders, you know, when they split away from Marvel, you know, Wildcats is X-Men, you know, uh, their approximations. I love I love Wildcats, just to say. Uh, but it's but yeah, they they did these things that are very close. You know, I was thinking about this. They're even close in like title. Oh yeah. Well, really quick, I, I actually did a, a piece on the 25th anniversary of Image, and they admitted it to me. They very specifically were like, we didn't want our readers from the previous books to get lost on the way over, basically. So they were trying to do as close. I don't want to say as close without getting sued, but I don't think it's entirely inaccurate. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that I'll split away and do my do the thing that I want to do. And it turns out like what I want to do is not is not exactly those things. You know, sure. it isn't, you know, it has something to do with that stuff, but it has to do with a lot of other things. And and after put after like publishing Packlist, I'm sort of like, oh, maybe I did this. I, I think I did this kind of wrong. And like, <laughs> I did not I didn't do this in a way wrong as far as what would work. Uh, sales wise or something like it, it maybe wasn't the right move to kind of go like, well, I want to do something that's kind of like a bridge between kind of mainstream and, you know, alternative comics in a way, or I'm, I'm always trying to like, I'm always thinking of some sort of balance of, of uh, American mainstream and American alternative and European and manga. I, I'm always thinking like in equal parts, these things I want, I want to like, utilize my favorite things about these different form, these different forms or the, uh, you know, these different influences. I mean, really quick. I mean, going back to it, it, in a real way, it seems like you're just embracing your different passions, like different sides of you in a lot of ways unpackless. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the, the worry that I have is, is always that there's not exactly like a super huge audience for, for this in comics, like sure. that are already reading comics. And, and so I'm always hopeful. I'm always like, well, maybe, 
maybe I'm speaking to somebody who's maybe would like this out of comics and there's, there's not a lot of it, you know, something that's not, not here or there, you know, but uh, as far as like, yeah, as far as like what I, what I learned in working for Marvel, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. That's an interesting, it's an interesting question that I have to think about. I mean, obviously just working, you know, working on these things get better and they, you're always learning, but I will just say that working on S.H.I.E.L.D. was a real taste of doing something that was creative in, you know, creating a world and creating characters. And that when S.H.I.E.L.D. was put on hiatus, everything felt like, even though, even though it's like, okay, well, you're going to do, I'm going to do the Avenger stuff, you know, which is like a huge step up as far as like profile and all that, you know. You know, it's like the, the biggest comic going or something, but it still felt like a step backwards for me because I'm like, well, I'm moving away from being creative. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, S.H.I.E.L.D. was kind of your type of jam. And so moving over to Avengers, where it's kind of more in the box, definitely doesn't seem like your type of thing. The thing I was going to say is I actually think one learning I had is when I did that Infinity Gauntlet mini oral history, I didn't, uh, for the Secret Wars one, I did not realize that basically Marvel editor Nick Lowe is like the biggest Dustin Weaver truther in the world. Like that guy, I mean, (laughs) he was comparing you to Jack Kirby and like he's like basically saying that you have like more original ideas than any artist he's ever worked with. That's paraphrasing. That's not exactly what he said, but he was just like so enamored with your stuff. And it's kind of funny when I was looking over kind of your history of the projects you've taken on, Nick's been the editor on a, a decent number of them. Yes. He's a believer. Yeah. I think I'm pretty good to work with, but there are times when I'm sort of like, well, I'll, well, I'll put, up, put up an argument for something, you know, where I'm like, no, I don't want to do it that way. And I'll, but I'll send like a excruciatingly long email, basically like describing my every single thought or whatever that sometimes I'm like, I hope I never was a pain in the ass, but there's certainly times when I'm, when I think back and I'm like, maybe I was a pain in the ass at that point. For the most part, I'm very pleasant. Not to paint the wrong picture. I don't think he would have complimented you so much if he thought you were such a pain. But, well, let's talk about Packless in specific. We've been talking about it whole, the whole time, but it's your Image Comics mostly one-man anthology series, which led to 1949, which is a collection of the 1949 se- story from that series that's about a detective existing across two wildly different times when she's awake and when she's asleep. Every issue is an oversized beast with a variety of stories in it, and there's sometimes pinups and other things, uh, like Quitting Comics isn't there, and that's like a two-page story you did in 2018. But... I will say this. I mean, part of the reason why Nick is so supportive of you is because Packless is, I mean, that's not why, but I mean, your nature as a creator is why, but every issue is like a pure beam of like creativity and ideas. It's like outrageous. And also, I mean, honestly, I, you know, I'm a fan, but it is one of the best looking comics period that you can find in or anywhere right now. And it's just absolutely unbelievable. We've talked about this a fair amount, but is this basically, is Packless basically you finding the thing that is what you always wanted for yourself in comics? Or is that an overly dramatic way to put it? I mean, it is, uh, but that's not the intention of it, I suppose. Like, uh, it kind of came about by, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't intending when I came, I came to Image and uh, I wanted to do something with Image. And the original idea was just to do, I had been drawing OmniCycle and putting it online. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to just do that in comic form. I had like a couple other ideas for there was a some sci-fi anthology comic and I was like oh, I want to contribute something to that and and I came up with a couple ideas for that and that didn't happen so I was just sitting there kind of wondering what I was going to do and um the idea of kind of doing an anthology was was the answer you know I'm a big fan of uh Dan Klaus's uh 8 Ball I mean, Eight Ball is just a really great comic, and I'm nothing like Dan Klaus as a as a as an artist, and my interests aren't the same. But the format was so cool, so I could just kind of do like we were saying in the beginning, you know, kind of follow any whim, kind of follow any. If I have a story, I can just do it. One thing that is really nice, and this was not part of my intention in doing it, is I do get to bypass the whole pitching process. <laughs> You pitch Packless as a concept. Now you can just do whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm not coming back to Image going like, I've got a new idea for a comic. I saw a hotel sign. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> that's all I've got right now. What do you say? I don't know what it's going to be. I don't have to do that, which is uh, nice because that's, uh, I'm not good at that. So like an art form unto itself. But yeah, yeah, I guess it, it is just me trying to make all the different kinds of comics or stories that I've liked, you know, mm-hmm. in, in some kind of way, like not to, you know, be too reductive about it or something. It is kind of funny, like the idea of a one person anthology, you mentioned eight ball by Den Klaus, mm-hmm. but also like another example is uh, Adrian Tomina's optic nerve. Like, you know, that's like sure. another one that's like a, a great fit for that. And it is kind of funny that this one person anthology concept is kind of in a lot of ways, more of an indie comics idea that you're incorporating into an image series. Not, yeah. n- not that image isn't indie in its own right, but it's just they're kind of a different species of comic. And yeah. it is fascinating to see that. And I don't know. I mean, that's one of the things that I think is interesting about comics as like a market mm-hmm. is there's always this idea that like people are like afraid of like things that they don't recognize. They're like anthology, like comics yeah. that are like a variety of different things. Ugh, what's going on with that? But I mean, I think part of that is no one really ever embraces it in the market and never really brings it to four. And so it's kind of hard to say whether or not people would be interested in it if it came out. So I mean, you're kind of a, an astronaut going on a maiden voyage in the direct market in some ways. Yeah, it, it feels that way. I guess I think of that corner of comics as like alternative comics, sure. sometimes art comics, uh, if it has that sort of intention to it. But yeah, it is bringing all that, that kind of alternative influence in. But uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of in like some sort of zone of like, I draw in a certain, I draw in a very commercial way. And I think that for any alternative comics people that like, that's their jam, they might be a little put off by that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm making a comic that's a little alternative. And maybe the people that are like, Hey, this looks maybe like a comic that I'd be into. And they're like, well, it's, I don't know how to get into this. It's not, it's not pushing the right buttons or something. This is just me being uh, uh, insecure about things. So (laughs) I've talked to people on the podcast about it before. It's like when you kind of have one foot on both sides where it's like you have the alternative comic side and then you also have like the, I mean, frankly, if Wildstorm did not get bought by DC and was still peak of its powers now, you would be their guy. Like, because you just kind of have that kind of feel, but not to say that that's where your influence is stopped. I mean, 1949 has a lot of European, like I mentioned earlier, like Mobius and kind of uh, Travis Sheree feel to it to some degree. Uh But it's like, when you operate on those two sides, it's like, sometimes it almost can feel, I seem to some degree that you almost belong with neither of them, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense to me. I mean, that's how I'm not trying to give you a complex by saying that, by the way. <laughs> no, no, I feel seen. <laughs> I'm like, yes, thank you. I, I'm uh, somewhere in this no man's land or something. I watch a lot of movies and I feel like I'm in some sort of zone that movies inhabit fairly well, you know, where, you know, not everything is a big action movie. Sure. A big blockbuster. But there's plenty of movies that aren't that way that are given the you know, the visual attention, they're, they're artful, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in, in comics, it feels like there's, like in, in American comics in particular, like there's this vast space where we could be being creative, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And now, a quick word from one of our sponsors. The summer is really heating up. Zoop continues to bring the heat with campaigns launching from Simpsons legend Bill Morrison, The Art of Descender from Dustin Nguyen and Jeff Lemire, Great Pacific, the completely trashed edition from Ice Cream Man's Martin Morazzo and Joe Harris, as well as the latest from pop manga artist Camilla De Erico. Also, there's still time to back campaigns from Sanford Green, Christian Ward, and other amazing creators. For creators looking to crowdfund your project or have your books for sale on Zoop's brand new e-commerce marketplace, Click the Submit Your Project link on zoop.gg as they are opening the doors to provide more services to even more creators. And now, back to the show. I think that one of the things that makes your creativity stand out so much is the fact that, you know, like, for for example, just in Packless number six, you have four wildly different comics between They'll Bury You Where You Stand, which you did with Jeremy Barlow. You did, Mm -hmm. there's a, a 1949 entry, there's Sagittarius A., uh, and then there's quitting comics. And 
I think that that's one of the things that makes this most the most interesting is it shows just how eclectic you can be as an artist and as an individual. But I, well, that, that is one of the, I mean, we talked about this a little bit with Juniper Lodge and about how, like, you're just like, I'm embracing the whim. But how do you decide what you're going to put in the book? Because that does seem to be one of the more difficult things because, like, Hero is there and now Hero's going to be gone and now Hero's going to be back in issue 10. Presumably, it's going to be back in issue 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you decide what you want to put in there? I have notes where I've, like, blocked out, like, okay, issue 12 will be this, issue this. And, you know, it gets more up in the air as it goes, like possibly this issue will be this or this maybe depending on, depending on many things. And, uh, but it's always changing. I mean, just recently I, I kind of had an idea of that. I want to take all of the stories that I have going and bring them to a, an end and then, but continue pack lists, but collect them. Well, they do need to be collected, but I want to like at a certain issue, all of them, including Sagittarius A, will be done. And then the next issue, I want to do it in a very different format. So I don't know what this will be, like Packlist 15 or something. So at the end of Quitting Comics, I put a fake ad for my superhero team that I created when I was uh, 13 with, with my buddy, uh, DJ. And I'm going to do, I, I think I, I think I want to do just like, it'll just be like a new breed issue. Just like maybe six issues that'll be new breed and it'll be me basically (laughs) exercising all of those like okay this is what i what i want to do with the superhero thing this is me getting all of that creativity uh out of my system in like one go you know yeah um but those issues i i you know this is just 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 occurred to me the other day like maybe that's how i'll do it because i when i think of doing new breed which is something that i want to do it sort of kind of has certain demands. Like I want the issues to feel like superhero comics. And so I feel like the whole format needs to change. I'm just still trying to like work out. Maybe, maybe I just change the format. Maybe it's like a shorter issue. And then we're getting way off in the future now. But like after that, I kind of return to the way Packless is to some in some way. Like maybe it'll be a little different, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was there was a gap between issues five and six uh, of Packless. <laughs> to some degree, I can't help but wonder if it'd be better off just to do New Breed as like a standalone thing that isn't in Packless. But at the same time, if Packless is kind of your one stop shop for all of your ideas, that would kind of fit it too. I don't know. It's it's kind of a tricky answer. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to have to pitch it though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's really the the most important part. Is like I got to make sure I don't have to pitch this. But yeah. If you do have to pitch it individually, I would highly recommend not charging $1.95 for it like you do on the cover, because I'm pretty sure Eric Stevenson would be like, ah, that's a little light right now. But yeah, that was the price of those like that's. Oh, I know. I know. It takes you back. But at the same time, like as soon as I saw that, I was just like, oh, were we ever so young? But um, with Packless. I think one of the interesting things is you're writing and drawing most of them. Obviously, you've worked with with others on some stories. But what is your process? Like, do you write full script for yourself? Or do you just kind of wing it and figure out answers and layouts? Like, what is your approach for this series? On different stories, the approach is different. Uh, OmniCycle has always been kind of improvisational. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, I mean, when I started that, I didn't know what was going to be in the next panel. Oh, wow. But as it went along, you know, I start... I think I drew the first like 12 pages of it just flying by the seat of my pants, not really knowing what was going to come next. And then I was kind of making it up scene by scene. At this point, though, I really am having to like think for far ahead. I have to like start working towards an ending. So it's it's become more like what I do with other with other projects, which is, you know, I will write an outline of the story and then I just sort of like I write as much as I know, as much as I can think of, and then I just kind of break up the outline into a comic and flesh it out. And I, I kind of almost write a full script for myself. I find that if a scene is very visually driven, maybe it's got like action, I will just go to a sketchbook and sketch that out and not think in words. I'll think visually. Um, but if it's a dialogue scene, I gotta just sit and write that like it's a like it's a play, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit of both, you know. It depends on what the scene is. 
Like, uh, yeah. like if you're drawing a scene of Hero going into a bathroom and opening his uh, guitar case with uh, a sword and guns in it, probably don't need to write that thing out in full because there's not a lot of dialogue there. I love <laughs> yeah. that scene. Well, uh, that was actually that was actually uh, DJ Bryant who oh who wrote that. Oh, and yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, who's my uh, been my friend since uh, New Breed? Since yes, exactly. Since we were thirteen, uh, twelve, even. Did you go to Phillips International in with him? A couple times, yeah, some, yeah, yeah. All right. He's basically the other guy in that comic where that's kind of us. Yeah. In 17, that's, you know, the conversation that we had is a conversation that we had when we were 17 years old, essentially. I, I'm the guy who's kind of going like, I'm going to be like the Beatles, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you basically, you become, you, you're the best, and then you uh, start becoming creatively adventurous, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but, but yeah, he, uh, he had a book out a few years ago called uh, Unreal City mm -hmm. uh, through Fanagraphics, which is uh, great. It's one of my favorite comics. And I'm not just saying that because he's my friend. Although him being my friend probably makes me a little predisposed to the stuff that he makes. So <laughs> that's okay. I'm like, yeah, oh, this is, uh, this is exactly what I want. But yeah, he uh, really brings a kind of balance to me in a way of like, uh, he brings more of that alternative side. He's he's more of an alternative kind of comics guy. Mm -hmm. Although his art style is rigorously drafted, like and extremely detailed. He uh, puts me to shame in that regard. I'm like, oh, man, well, how are you? Why? Why are you doing this now? <laughs> I don't want to get into the process of this, but one thing I do find really charming about Packless as a series is how the inside front cover to each issue is just this one page micro story that is always very meta to the point where yeah. I, I think it was issue six, where it just basically you were surrounded by your own characters, including Anwin from Infinity Gauntlet, which I really yes. appreciated. Yeah, yeah. Why is that something you wanted? To, not the Anwin part, but just like those inside pages. Like, why is that the appropriate way for you to start off Packless? Because I love it. It's just, it was, I remember reading it the first time and I was so surprised by it. Originally, I was thinking, you know, I have, I'm going to have a page that is just like the intro page, whatever. Maybe it'll have like a table of contents or something. But I was, I, I thought like, I want to fill this comic with comics. Like, I want to make everything a comic. So that page will be a comic. And uh, it started there, and they, so with that short format, it's kind of like they're all a kind of gag, right? And which lends them to a little slightly more humorous vibe. And uh, another thing that influenced that was uh, on Astro Boy reprints that Osama Tezuka did. He would sometimes draw a little intro to them with where he introduces the comic, uh, and he talks a little bit about it. And this kind of influenced me inserting my own self into these things is sort of it was inspired by Tezuka introducing Astro Boy comics but yeah it's sort of different yeah it's it's always a little bit meta i get i get to time travel in issue 0 to before <laughs> to before it's fun to to put yourself into a comic and and uh um yes uh make fun of yourself in a way I was going to say you were in all of them besides number seven, I think. Even, uh, I think it's, is it zero? No, no, it's eight. It's eight that you appear just walking by outside the diner as Hero and the lead from 1949 are talking. I think that's you, isn't it? There's a few characters in there uh, that are kind of callbacks to other characters. I don't think that, that it's me, though. Oh, it's not? Okay. I may have been overestimating based off the facial hair that you had in your other ones. So, <laughs> yeah. my bad, my bad. <laughs> I do represent changing facial hair in these. <laughs> really, that's where your art evolves, is how your facial <laughs> hair evolves in the book. It's it's actually you yeah. testing out potential looks for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I like, change the look, and I'm like, this is it. This is my new look forever now. And then a few months later, I'm like, nope, this is not it. So I think it's really interesting. It It seems like basically your entire career. I mean, I, I think this is true to some degree for everyone, but it feels especially true for you. I said the word evolve. It does feel like you're constantly evolving, both through the inputs that are coming in and the projects you're taking on. As you mm -hmm. kind of move forward in your career, and it seems like you kind of have an idea of what you want to do down the line with Packlist and with New Breed and everything like that, as long as it doesn't involve pitching, of course. Does what you want for yourself in your art constantly evolve and has it kind of throughout your entire career? Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, I think 
what I'm feeling like pushes me in certain directions, but I kind of have just this backlog of ideas that kind of run a gamut and they have enough uh, that isn't set in stone about them where I can kind of go, well, I feel like, you know, with like Juniper Lodge, which is a fairly new idea, but it kind of fits in with a whole mode of creating that I would like to go into, which is kind of that more real world, uh, real people, but maybe there's like a, you know, I don't know, a certain kind of drama or supernaturalness or something going on to it. But, you know, I have, a, I've got a backlog of ideas that maybe suit that. And if I go, well, I can take this old idea and kind of combine it with who I am now and kind of re re-envision it through that lens, I'm constantly kind of looking at, uh, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, that is to say that a lot of what I want to do and what I want to do in the future has been, has actually been thought of, uh, Right beforehand, like years, years in advance, you know, I've, there's, you know, there's still stories. I have, I have a story that I would like to do in Packless at some point that is, uh, fits that mold that I'm talking about. It's a real world thing, but I thought of it, you know, back in my early twenties. And what's cool about that is that it comes with a kind of thinking that I can't really do now, you know, like the thinking that a younger person does. And I can, I can, I can take that and combine it with what I know now, you know, and make a, uh, you know, make something new out of it that wasn't what it was originally, but hopefully has that, those elements to it. Evolving, I don't know that it's something you can be too conscious of, of you know. Yeah, you can't force it. I do think it's interesting, though, because a thing that I've talked to a lot of people about recently is, and this is as old as comics are, but artists having so many ideas that they want to tackle in their lifetime, but they don't have the time to draw them all. So they start yeah. working with other artists. And it's interesting because you write and you draw your own work, but you, at least to my knowledge, have not really written for others. Um, I did on Rocksteady and Bebop comics. Yes, and that there is that one. But I mean, is, is that something you would want to do with your personal ideas or are those ones that you feel like you have to tackle yourself as an artist? It's an interesting thing to do. Of all the ideas that I really want to make, I really want to draw them too. Uh, yeah. The thought of uh, of going like, okay, well, I'm going to turn this over to a different artist, and now it's going to be filtered through them. It changes it. it. It will be something different, you know. I mean, that's the great thing about you know collaborating is literally is like you get to be a different artist in a way. You get to create something you would not have created all alone, and that's that's there's a kind of a great thing to that, you know, because you're. Like you're, there's a, there's a, there's a tyranny of the self or something. I don't know. There's like, you can't escape your own tendencies. And so unless you collaborate, then you can kind of become something else, you know, through them. And so I don't know, I would have to think of an, uh, it would have to be an idea that I have with that in mind. Mm -hmm. And it would be cool to do on like a smaller scale and sort of try it out, you know? Right. Um, well, I mean, the Rockstar and Bebop stuff was pretty it's pretty uh, silly stuff, uh, but it was very interesting to see. There was a series of uh, Roxanne Be Able to Destroy Everything where uh, we had different artists. It was a time travel story, and there was a different artist for each time period. And so it was like skipping skipping between artists, uh, which was really fun to coordinate uh, and, and get artists on board. But you really see the difference in how artists... Shift the story. Yeah, or, you know, how the what artists are bringing, you know, uh, you know, on that, like, uh, Sophie Campbell was on that. And uh, Sophie Campbell was really good. I don't know if you know. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, Sophie yeah. Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Famously so. Uh, and Sophie Campbell, you know, I, I, you know, send the script. And when Sophie Campbell got the script, things were brought to it, creative decisions that I hadn't thought of, just, uh, she made it her own. And uh, it was like really cool to see. I'm like, oh wow, okay, that's that's what that's like. <laughs> that's, yeah, to be to be a writer and turn something over to like a really great artist, and uh, and that feels great. And for the most part, you're kind of like, I, I will say, just generally, like turning a script over and then it gets drawn. It, it as an artist who's used to having to do all the drawing, it feels like a uh, like magic. It feels mm -hmm. like a like. 
like you're really getting away with something right like i've uh, like wait a second i just write down what i want the comic to be and somebody <laughs> makes it this is a racket <laughs> what a <laughs> it sounds like something you like i I'm, I'm just kind of surprised you haven't done more of it but i mean there's only so much time in a day right yeah yeah and i'm not u- very good at, at utilizing all of it that's why you work at the night yeah exactly uh, I'm taking naps most of the time. <laughs> I, I will say I mostly if my wife or daughter need me for anything, I there's no comic book work that will stop me from doing stuff with them. Oh, sure. So, yeah. So it is that's always the priority, which means I'm even slower than I could be if I were an asshole, I suppose. <laughs> Well, Dustin, I have no doubt that that is not a problem for you. But that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about Packless, your career in comics, your path to where you are, and everything else. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, yeah, it's been great. It's been, uh, you know, I've been listening for years, so it's great to finally be on. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with writer-artist Dustin Weaver. You can find his work in Packless in 1949 at Image Comics and him on Twitter and Instagram. Big thanks to Deanna Chapman for stepping in to edit this episode. If it sounds better than usual, it's because of her. Love Off Panel, want to support it? Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating and review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing it on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash off panel. And when you back it on there, you get early access to each week's podcast as well as weekly content and more. Want even more? Subscribe to my Eisner Award nominated subscription comic site Sketched at sketch.com for long form articles, interviews, and the rest of the site's content. You can find off panel and sketched on social media by following on Twitter and Instagram at, at sketchcomic or following me at, at slicefriedgold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Milton Lawson, David Wilson, Joe, Benjamin Wilkins, Chris Hacker, John Neesmith, John Auerbach, Dustin Weaver, Ninja Assassin Love Story Webcomic, Brandon Heyman, Aiden Hammond, Kenny Myers, Faith Aaron Hicks, Ah yeah, Comics, Ben Rowe, Cameron Brown, Jonathan Breen, Danny Ollie, Charlie Stickney, Tom Drennan, Jeremy Thomas Burke, Jared Schwab, Scott Dunn, Chip Mosher, Seth Pomeroy, James McEwen, Andrew Lehman, Christina Merkler, Scott Place, Travis Gibb, Darcy Van Polgies, Tom Evans, Reed Beeman, Kelly Sudaconic, Max Wood, Jeremy Lambert, Brian Hold, Nir Levy, Jason Hussa, Kieran Gillen, Jonathan Kent Uratam, Harry Johnson, Jingo Boren, James Steiner IV, Chris Langford, Jason Wood, Tom Peachy, Ben Domstead, Rom V, Nick Walker, Patrick Coyle, Isaac Oren, Capes and Tights Podcast, Claus Vandeven, Submed Industries, Jack Mulqueen, Carl Kershaw, Robert Masella, Elza Chartier, Luke Nakashoji, Dr. Luke, Scott Hazelwood, Canadian by Proxy, Bradley Rader, Carl Choi, Brandon Pills, Patrick Bauer, Declan Shalvey, Dan Garino, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Klein Q, Leona Kingist, Nick Bennett, Daniel Whitfield, Susanna Polo, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, Andrew Carita, Stephen Holt, Phil Myra, Chris Pachala, Torin Grunbeck, Buzz Bubbles, Christopher Todd, Transmitter Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Wesley Giff, Sean Kirkham, Julia Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwand, Vita Yala, Akil, Philip Seavey, Al Ewing, David Kelly, Nick Polito, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogart, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendrick, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Call McMahon, Adam Heifel, Fiona Staples, Mark Abnett, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks from Wolfpack for letting me use their song, Outro, as the show's opening theme, and to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote, performed, off-panels, outro, and ad music just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify, because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode. <laughs>